Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My book, Beyond the Lines, is about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness, which is what this show is all about. Today is extra special because it's my 100th TV show, and I didn't think I'd make it to 20 when I first started this. But seriously, I want to sincerely thank you for making Beyond the Lines the number one TV show for two years now. My special guest today achieved global success as a singer with his hit song, Nothing's Gonna Change My Love For You. And you know we all love that song. And he's the highly respected president of St. Louis School. He is the one and only Dr. Glenn Medeiros, and today we are going beyond leadership. Hey, Glenn, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me back again. Congratulations on 100 different shows. Oh, wonderful. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> now, Glenn, I want to ask you, you know, as bad as the coronavirus situation is, what do you feel are some of the positives that's going to come out of it? Well, as a former history teacher, I can tell you that out of the worst uh, scenarios in the world, uh, whether it be World War II uh, or other very horrible things that have happened, uh, the human spirit always shows up and, and good things come from it. And I do think that we will get through this eventually and learn from it. And, uh, and I think we'll be better prepared for another situation like this. Uh, at the same time too, when people are in that uh, survival mode, often, uh, people will come together. And that's what, what I ultimately want to see. I see some of it happening. I'd like to see more of it happening, but we have to come together, work together as Americans to, to, to see ourselves through this as a team. Totally agree with you, Glenn. And, you know, I know that you're, you and your wife, Tammy, are super proud of your kids' uh, chord and lyric. What, what are they doing now? Well, uh, they're both in college. My son's at, in the engineering program at UH and He's, uh, you know, getting through. He's, he's done, been doing really well in class. Uh, he's in his second year now. And my daughter's at Notre Dame, University of Notre Dame, and she's, uh, she's doing really well there, too. She loves being there. And uh, so, so it's nice to be able to see them and live vicariously through them in many ways. I, I, I could never, ever uh, pass any engineering class, and I'm so happy my son is doing that now and doing well. <laughs> And I would never have been able to make it into Notre Dame <laughs> as a high school student. So, so anyway, uh, but it's nice to see them doing well. Oh, I think me and you both, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that you went to the Nationals uh, for tennis last year with your adult tennis team. How was, how was that experience for you? Well, it was great because the first place team couldn't make it. The second place team couldn't make it. So, <laughs> the, the third place team tried our best. We tried our best to represent Hawaii. And it was great. I had a good time. Uh, it was extremely, uh, you know, the, the players played at a real high level. But it was encouraging for us in many ways because it wasn't too far away from where we we're at. So, so we know that, you know, if you put in the time, put in the practice, we can win at the national level. Uh, won a couple games here and there, but for the most part, we got... We got beat up pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't hit it in, huh, Glenn? You got to hit it oh, in. Oh, you know what? I, I, I hit it, but they just hit it back. That was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> now, Glenn, I, you know, I want to thank you for writing the foreword of, in my new second book, Beyond the Game. And you were the first person to read the book. What is it about mm -hmm. the, the new book that you like? Well, first of all, thank you. I read a lot of books. I'm reading every day. And I was just so blown away by your book. I like to read a lot of books about leadership, about improving the self and improving others. And, and what I like about your book with the three C's, uh, you keep it simple. You take complicated concepts and you make it simple. And I think that helps people. And the other thing too is we know in education that the highest level of learning, at least of the retention of learning, is when you teach and it's really obvious to see that you've been out there and you've been working with companies, you've been presenting, you have this television show and you're constantly not just teaching, but you're learning the, at the same time. 
and that really came out in your in your second book. So hopefully this will be a part of a long series of books for you. <laughs> hey, Glenn, <laughs> it's it's hard to write one book, let alone two books, you know. <laughs> but you know, you know what we've did. Uh, you know, I need to talk to some of your uh, St. Louis alumni because I've we've done mm -hmm. some big book donations to schools like Iolani and Damien and yes. Castle and McKinley. So maybe I'll be able to connect with some of your St. Louis alumni to do a big book donation to, to your students of your school. That would be great. That would be excellent. Uh, our tennis team could use your help for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, tennis guys. <laughs> hey, every sport, every sport needs help. It, it, that's though. right, every sport. <laughs> it's, a, it's a constant striving for excellence. <laughs> now, Glenn, no, you know, um, when I was assistant coach in tennis, when I worked at Marino, um, it, it was, uh, we'd always say that's the one sport that we can win St. Louis at, you know, tennis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh crack me up, Glenn. You crack me up. <laughs> now, let's talk, let's talk a bit about your singing career. You know, when you look back now, I mean, your, your big hit song, Nothing's Gonna Change My Love For You, was such a global success. Looking back, why do you think it was such a big hit? Well, you know, that's a really good question because the song was originally recorded by George Benson. And I had, I'm a huge George, George Benson fan. And I used the song at Brown Banks of Stardom. And uh, the winner of the contest, of course, was entitled to record the song, record a song. I was looking for original material at the time. I didn't. Oh, I wasn't writing my own music. I was 16 at the time, and uh, the the record producer at I94 said, "No, Glenn, I really think that you should record. Nothing's going to change my love for you because it was recorded by George Benson, who is this incredible artist, but was known more as a jazz type singer uh, for for some, and for that reason, some of his records." although they were incredible, they didn't have the kind of success that it could have had. And the example they gave me was Whitney Houston's uh, song, Greatest Love of All, which was written, you know, the same writer who wrote Greatest Love of All also, also wrote, Nothing's Gonna Change My Love For You. His name is Michael Massey. He passed away a couple of years ago. And anyway, they said, look, if, if, if we think Whitney did it with Greatest Love of All, when George Benson had originally recorded that, you think you could do the same thing with Nothing's Gonna Change My Love For You? And it ended up happening and you know, uh, you know, seven million records later, they were right. I think the the secret to success with that particular song, even though I still prefer George Benson's version, uh, I I do think that uh, the video played a huge role with that. You know, it was filmed here. It was filmed on Kauai, where I was born and raised, and uh, it was a beautiful video on the beach. Uh, I think a lot of young people connected to it, and uh, it's a positive message. And, and it's a, although it's a ballad, it's kind of got a little beat to it. So I think the positive energy, the positive message, uh, in combination with the youthful, you know, feel that I had at 16, I think worked out well. Oh, totally agree with that, Glenn. And, you know, to this day, I mean, it, it, that song is still amazing. I mean, it, it has to be on everybody's, uh, playlist for sure. And, you did a you you had a hit song with Bobby Brown back in the day called "She Ain't Worth It." What mm -hmm. what was the what was most fun about working with Bobby uh, when you guys were doing that song together? Well, it's fun because I although I didn't really sing hip hop, I I really enjoyed listening to hip hop and having Bobby in the studio and spending time with him every day. Uh, you know, you just, you're looking at him and you think, my God, he's here in this room. I, I can't believe I'm working with him. Uh, the guy was just oozing with talent. And he was a very friendly, really caring person. I mean, he had, unfortunately, what I tell people, and I'm sure Bobby doesn't mind me sharing this because he's done it himself, is basically, you know, he had a struggle with drugs. And, and so, you know, I saw that in the studio, there were days he'd come in and, and he was just a different person. And and then he come back the next day and he's very friendly with everyone and such a nice guy. So, you know, it's, it's something that a lot of people are dealing with uh, in the world and especially in the music industry, you see a lot of people, it's a very stressful life. And for a lot of people, just the drugs is something that they turn to. And I'm, I'm hoping that I have been able to meet Bobby in the last five years, a couple of times, and he seems to be doing well now. Oh, that's so great to hear. And, 
you know, I, I love watching your video with Bobby, you know, the She Ain't Worth It video. And are, are you are you teaching your dance moves uh, to the St. Oh, Louis students? <laughs> I was just talking, it's so funny because I was just talking to my my um, my wife and my kids about it yesterday. We were down at the beach and I, I just, they were talking, the, somehow the video came up and, and I said, well, number one, I just wish somebody was there to tell me stop dancing. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> I gotta watch that thing for the rest of my life. I mean, it was the, the producers that were like, "Do this, Glenn. Do that." And I, I really felt uncomfortable. But uh, you know, in retrospect, it's uh, you know, I, I had a good time overall. It was a great experience. Well, I, I thought you danced really good, Glenn. So oh, God. there, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Now, let's talk about football. I mean, I know you're a big-time uh, 49ers fan, and uh, mm -hmm. I know you're very happy about that they had a, such a great team this past year. But let's yes. let's talk about, you know, Marcus Mariota and Tua Tungavailoa, how, mm -hmm. you know, Marcus is going to the Raiders and Tua got drafted by the Dolphins. I'm sure that all of St. Louis school are instant Raiders and Dolphins fans, along with uh, all of Hawaii. Yes. What are your thoughts yes. about uh, Marcus and Tua? Well, as with everyone, we were hoping that Marcus would be in a situation where he could be the starter. Uh, he's going to be backing up right now but I, at, in Las Vegas. But I do think it's a perfect city, of course, for people from Hawaii to go to and support Marcus. I think he's making a really good decision because you want to find a place where uh, the coaching staff really can give you the kind of um, – the kind of tutoring that you need. And he's a great quarterback, great athlete, great person. Uh, and, but also, you know, um, uh, John Gruden is one of the best uh, quarterback coaches and offensive coordinators around. So I think he knows that he'll probably grow under him. And eventually with his leadership skills and he's such a good person, uh, you know, everyone at the Titans loved him. The whole town loved him in Nashville. And I think Las Vegas will love him too. And I, I think eventually he will have his opportunity to be able to start again. Totally agree. So that's good. Yeah. And as far as um, uh, you know, Tua is concerned, I'm, I just wanted him to go up as high as possible in the draft. And for him to be able to make it as a fifth pick in the draft is, is truly amazing. He, you know, both, both of them, both Marcus and Tua, what I appreciate about them is that they really are leaders. Uh, they, they, they have their own style. Um, Marcus is a, a little bit more quiet, uh, a, you know, lead by example. Uh, Tua is his faith in God is so strong and powerful. And he shares that with everyone around him. And I, I do think, you know, Tua was really not sure as to whether or not to go to USC, uh, which is, uh, my alma mater. And, and, uh, he ended up choosing, Alabama, I was a little bit sad about that. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, but in retrospect, I do think Alabama was the right choice for him because of the way things worked out, but also because the, his faith was really embraced uh, in the South. And, and I think you know, that's something I'm going to keep in mind, too, as we have other students that are similar to him. Finding the right fit is really important. So, And he, he'll be a great leader, I think. Uh, I hope is you know, we're all praying that his health is going to hold up, but but uh, he's, he is truly amazing. So uh, I, I see great things for the both of them. Glenn, you know, Coach Cal Lee and Coach Ron Lee, I mean, they are both extraordinarily, you know, successful coaches. And mm -hmm. it's amazing how Cal Lee stepped down as head coach and put Ron Lee as head coach now. And Cal's going to be the de defensive coordinator. I mean, they're they're mm -hmm. just super amazing coaches. Now, what do you, what is it about them that you admire so much? I admire a lot about them. I I would say, as an educator myself, I look at them as educators because coaches really are, and and uh, with they're different though. They're very different. They work together, and they're going to continue working together. So we'll get the benefits of both of them uh, working as a team, but. Uh, Cal is a facilitator. He's not the kind of guy that's going to, if you watch him on the field, he's not there getting in everyone's face and, and telling them what to do. He, he watches people closely. When he does say something, everyone listens because it's rare that he does. He lets his assistant coaches coach. Uh, whereas 
Ron is a little bit different. Ron is a perfectionist and he's there every single play. He's this, you never do it right. Let's get back to the beginning. Let's start it all over again. Every second of every throw, every turn, you know, that a wide receiver makes, everything has to be perfect. And sometimes I talk to the students about it and they're, they, they're, you know, they'll tell me, oh my God, you can't even imagine Dr. Medeiros, how much of a perfectionist he is. So, <laughs> so, so, and, you know, to be able to run an offense like that at the high school level, I, you know, it's, it's not easy to do, to get the timing of a passing offense the way, the way we have it. So, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we're, we're looking for, you know, we lost a lot of really good players this year. Uh, we, we've got players going to Notre Dame, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Cal California, Berkeley, a lot of really good seniors. Uh, so we're going to be a young team next year, but I do think that as they always do, they're going to develop them into really strong players. Oh, yeah. I mean, look at, I mean, St. Louis football has set the standard for football in high school sports in Hawaii. So, I mean, it's, and look how long uh, Cal and Ron have been working together. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's unprecedented. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. No, it's, yeah, it really is. I think it's a combination of, of their incredible ability to coach and then the environment at St. Louis School because it, I, the closest, you know, when I went up to Notre Dame and I uh, dropped off my daughter, I said to myself, my God, there's so many similarities between St. Louis School and Notre Dame. Uh, you know, Notre Dame started in 1842. St. Louis School started in 1846. Um, she's a strong tradition of, of, of football, yet strong tradition also of people that have graduated to go out to do many incredible things. Uh, the devotion to Mary, as, as is with uh, Notre Dame and St. Louis School. They have the, you know, the Fighting Irish. We have the Fighting Crusaders. Uh, they, are, they were an all-boys school until the 70s. So everywhere you look, you'll see brotherhood everywhere, which is a common term that we have here at St. Louis School. So when you put on the red and blue at St. Louis School, there's an expectation of excellence. And you know what that's like, you know, having been at Poon Ho, um, I You know, did I ever tell you my story about when I was a, an assistant coach and we played you at Punahou. I don't know if you probably no, you, don't remember. You got to tell me. Tell me. Oh, my God. It was so funny. So <laughs> all the students, <laughs> so they were kind of waiting on the side for, for the games to start. And you were always really good because you would have, you know, your third, fourth best players play us so that it would be, you know, the matches wouldn't go too quickly. Uh, but anyway, we're sitting down and we're waiting and the, there was some warming up going on. And so a couple of the players came up to me and said, oh, Mr. Medeiros. They're going to kill us. These guys are really good. And I said, I hate to tell you guys this, but those are the like the middle school students. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was when you were helping uh, assistant coach at Marinol? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always tried to play my weakest lineups against yes. Marinol. Uh, yeah, you, you were really Saint good Lewis about and that. HBA, yes. you know. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> I, I know, I mean, I went to Damien, so, you know, I, I, I know about yeah, the small yeah. schools, so. It's yeah. just a whole other level of playing, you know. And so <laughs> when sometimes they would just want to go and watch them because the, the quality of play was so high, so. Yeah. Well, Glenn, you know, let's let's talk about character. And, you know, in my first book, Beyond the Lines, I, I talk a lot about character. And I know that you are such a great man of character and you're trying to instill that in all of the students at St. Louis School. What are your thoughts about the importance of character? You know, character is a big part of what we try working on at, at St. Louis School. Uh, we, we refer to the traits of a St. Louis man at St. Louis School. And it's really all about being a gentleman. Uh, at St. Louis School, uh, we look at uh, Mary, uh, mother of Jesus, being the ultimate educator. So what would Mary want her son to turn out to be? And Mary would want her son to be a gentleman, uh, 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 one who respects others, or respects herself, uh, and, and treats women in particular with a extremely high amount of respect. And, um, and so we take a lot of pride in that at St. Louis School, that being able to respect others. And, uh, and 
I think once you learn to respect yourself and you respect others, uh, everything else will, will come into play. The other thing too is we teach them to, part of being a St. Louis man is being courageous. I think it's very difficult to attain the other characteristics you need uh, unless you are courageous. You, you have to be willing to take chances. You cannot be afraid. And if you are afraid, realize that that's okay. It's a, it's a normal thing. Uh, when I see our students uh, on the football field, basketball, court, whatever it may be, uh, whether they're competing in robotics or they're competing uh, in some kind of uh, hula festival, I, you see the courage and um, the teamwork that they have, uh, the support that they have for each other. It's, it's really nice to see. And, and they're young men. They make mistakes, right? You put a whole bunch of boys together, they're going to get koloe sometimes, you know. <laughs> they they, uh, they jump, all, jump all over each other. They hug each other. They, but you really see that uh, I, I, I watch them closely. And when it's time for them to, to really be there and be a gentleman, they do it. And it's, it's really nice to see. Well, you know, you've created such a, a superior culture of excellence at, at St. Louis School. And so in addition to being courageous, in addition to character, what's another top priority of yours with the students in your culture? For us, it's about giving back. It's a service. So if you, I mean, when you look at Marcus, uh, he's a perfect example, I think, of what a St. Louis man is. He is not, uh, he's well-rounded, uh, but he takes his talents and he uses it to help other people. So you know, he, he's helped to build homes for people recently in Nashville. He, he has a scholarship with us. So several kids are going to school at no cost because of his scholarship. He's constantly helping out there in the community. So, you know, it's not enough for us to be able to educate someone so well in science that they can go and make billions of dollars or millions of dollars. What we want is someone that can make millions and billions, but then take some of that money and give it back to the community. And that's part of who we are as a Marianist school, as uh, the Marianist uh, practice that. And it's part of their charism. It's part of who we are as a Marianist school, where it's not just about uh, you know, sharing your talents out there. It's about taking that, what you have and, share, and, and giving back to the community. No, I really love hearing that, Glenn. And you know, it's just, it's amazing to watch, you know, the impact that you've had um, for some years now as, as president of St. Louis School and just see how, I mean, everyone is buying into that, you know, high culture of excellence. And, you know, just another thing about your character. I mean, I know that you performed at a women's prison and that was a goal of yours. What, mm -hmm. what did you yes. learn about them when you performed at the women's prison? Uh, wow. No, uh, that was an experience that I wanted to have happen for a long time. I didn't know what to expect, honestly. And it's an experience I'll never forget. Uh, not only were we able to meet these women in prison, but we we're also able to meet their children. And, uh, what's interesting is that we have a graduate of St. Louis school and he's the warden there. And it was his idea to give an opportunity for the children and the mothers to spend time together. And I think the, the toughest, well, number one, they were just so happy that we were there. A lot of them seems to, you know, seem to have liked 80s music. So I was there playing my guitar and <laughs> they started singing along and uh, they didn't know who I was, you know, who I was when I got in there. But as soon as I started singing, next thing you know, they said, okay, let's sing this song or let's sing this together. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, when the kids came in, uh, I kind of connected with one of the kids. And so I spent about the next uh, half an hour to an hour, uh, you know, teaching him how to play the uh, guitar and the ukulele that I brought over. And we were able to kind of create a friendship there. So uh, the hardest part about the whole thing was having to see the kids go because, uh, you know, you, you had kids crying, uh, you know, you have the parents crying. And, uh, but... You know, in all, you just, it teaches you to appreciate, uh, you know, what we have, my ability to be able to spend time with my two kids and, and uh, 
and and I just keep hoping and praying that you know for those women there that they'll get the opportunity to get out of prison. Well, Glenn, you know you're a you're a man of words and actions, and you know how you talked about service and helping community. I mean, that's that's you right there. I mean, you 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 talk the talk and you walk the walk exactly. And I want to <laughs> ask you. you, what is one of the toughest challenges that you had to overcome in your life? Uh, I think the biggest challenge for me was, uh, was dealing with the negative aspects of the music industry. Uh, there, I, I'm a family person. I like being around, I like being at home. I like a simple life. I think having touring around the world to about 40 countries, being away from my family, uh, being alone. Uh, and although I'm not, I'm not the kind of person that likes to go out and be in crowds of people, but I do like to spend time with, you know, the few friends and family that I do have. So, uh, and, and then also living, you know, financially when you're singing, although from the outside, it looks like, wow, these guys are making a lot of money and things look good for most artists out there. Don't really make a whole lot of money because it costs a lot of money to be out on tour and to be traveling around the world. And, and so, it was a very a stressful a period of time in my life when I was out there singing, even though it was a great educational experience. And for me, the way to get over it ultimately was to go back to school. And, and I, I told myself, you know, that, uh, you know, in, in singing, I was performing from the age of 16 to about 24. So eight years of being on the road and selling, you know, over, you know, probably about 10 million records and, and working really hard. And, and then to have the you know, record company just kind of say, ah, we're not interested anymore. And uh, that was pretty hard to take. And so for me, I told myself that I want to put myself in a situation where I can attain an education and that I'll always be able to bounce back on my feet again. And so the, that was the driving force behind me attaining my bachelor's degree, master's degree, and then my doctorate is I didn't want to experience what it was like again to live life on the edge, you know, financially, uh, to be away from my family. Uh, and it's been, it was worth every, I mean, if it's been worth every single hour that I put into school, because, you know, I want to be at St. Louis school for a very long time, but if it ever comes a time where, you know, they want to go in a different direction, I know that I can, you know, take what I've learned and continue it elsewhere. In the music industry, you can't really do that. And once, once, you can, but it's difficult to do. Uh, once, once you've had success, people kind of say, "Okay, he's an '80s guy," or you know, or he's this and this. This kind of music is not really popular anymore. Whereas, if you're you're a successful CEO, you can jump from one company to another company because you bring those same skills with you. And if you've proven to be successful in the past, well, you know these companies will take a chance on you. No, oh, that's great insights right there, Glenn. And I want to ask you one more thing before we wrap up. What's what's one of the biggest things that the best leaders do? In my opinion, the best leaders, it, it really is about communication. Uh, I, I really think that if you can communicate well, uh, then you're going to be a strong leader. Uh, uh, and it just communication when, when you're a leader, your time is so limited that although communicating sounds simple, it's very easy to get sidetracked and, and not communicate the way you need to. So for instance, you know, we're, we're going through this pandemic right now. And typically I send out a newsletter to parents, maybe about once every two months, but now that we're experiencing this pandemic and we're online, uh, I send a newsletter out every single week because it's important for the families to know, okay, this is where we're at. This is, you know, this is what we see coming. And as a, as a leader, you, you have to communicate really well and not only to the middle management, but also to everybody, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's, you know, sometimes I'll sit down and I'll talk to the janitor and say, what do you see? How do you like what's happening around here? Uh, work with middle management, uh, work with my board, you know, work with other presidents of other schools. Uh, communication, in my opinion, is the key. 
I'm glad you said that, Glenn, because uh, that's one of my three C's of leadership in Beyond the Game. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Not just because I'm Portuguese and communication comes natural right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm part Portuguese with you. My, my grandma would just absolutely love you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that sometimes we communicate a little too much, but yeah. that's, that's okay. <laughs> Hey, Glenn, I want to thank you, you know, for joining me on my 100th episode today and, and for writing the forward in my, my new book and really sharing your insights with me on today's TV show. Well, thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing for our community. Thank you for your new book. Please, everybody, get this book. It's an it's, it's amazing book. And uh, good luck. And uh, keep working. We'll work on your third one. Coming up, maybe a couple years from now. <laughs> we got to pray. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> well, all right. congratulations. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Take care. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit RustyKomori.com. And my books are available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and BooksHawaii.net. I hope that Glenn and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.